Good afternoon. It's great to uh, be back. Uh, uh, you know, this is an old Lebanese uh, panel, so you expect uh, it's bubbly. It's being bubbly, especially at this time of uh, the moment we are in, in Lebanon, with the elections coming. We have a candidate on the table. We have a uh, policy and senior advisor on the table. We have a criti critique of the government on the table, an academic on the table. So it's going to be, I promise you, some exciting discussion <laughs> on this panel about Lebanon as, as uh, and the uh, pluralism in, in Lebanon. And I think Lebanon as a model of pluralism has been mentioned uh, a day ago by the German president. And all people on Twitter and social media were telling him, haven't you actually been seeing the news, what's happening on the street? There's, there's some misguided advice to the president uh, of Germany. But maybe he was looking at it in a romantic way as a face value of Lebanon's pluralism, which exists and does exist. But we need, I guess, particularly in this panel, but also beyond when we discuss Lebanon and read Lebanon, actually dig deep to understand how Lebanese society is increasingly divided and is increasingly becoming unequal at many levels. Economically, I think this is one of the highest places on earth where, where inequalities exist. Yesterday, I got to see a number and I tweeted it. 45% of wealth in Lebanon is concentrated among 1% of the adult population. It's 55%. 55 now, huh? updated from Gilbert. And 70% and, and of wealth is concentrated among 10% of the population. That's even worse than many of the unequal or places where are inequalities. But also across sectarian lines, we see more and more divisions in this plural society we are in. Across national and Racial lines, in some, in some instances, we see discrimination and divisions. The way refugees are being treated in the country is, in many instances, disgraceful, to say the least, by actually discriminating institutionally against Palestinians as well as Syrian refugees. The way we treat immigrants and migrant workers and domestic workers is also, in many instances, uh, uh, shameful. Gender discrimination also exists, and I'm sure it's going to be discussed in many levels, including women inability to give nationality for their, uh, for their children if they're married to non-Lebanese. It's endless, and I think that's a key issue we've been trying to address in the Institute here in, in IFI and in AUB, trying to look at those divisions and inequality in a more, in a less romantic way, in a more, you know, policy-oriented uh, 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 discussion and more policy-oriented debates. I'm going to stop here, but I want to say that many of those divisions in society are unfortunately are being fueled and intensified by state policies and regulations. Those institutions that we have in the state, whether formal and informal, you know, unfortunately, they've been entrenching those divisions at different levels. So I really welcome this great panel and great friends and colleagues here around the table. We will start with, uh, with Tamiras Fakhouri from the Lebanese American University. I'll just briefly introduce Tamiras and then introduce each speaker by order of the program. So Tamiras, <coughs> looking at the, the list. She's an associate professor of political science and international affairs in the Department of Social Sciences at the Lebanese American University. Our uh, 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 friends across the, the block here in Ras Beirut. And uh, she's an associate director of the Institute of Social Justice and Conflict Resolution. She previously taught summer sessions at the University of California, Berkeley, between 2012 and 2016. We'll give 12 minutes for each panelist, and then we'll open it for discussion. Ten minutes. Yeah, thank you, Nasser. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm really thrilled to be part of this panel. So my talk will tackle the concept of power sharing or consociationalism as a tool for building pluralism and inclusion in post-Arab spring states before drawing on the example of Lebanon to show the trade-offs or dilemmas uh, between power sharing, democracy, and inclusion. <clears throat> Um, so in the wake of the relapsed Arab Spring, not only governance, but actually political studies in the region have been facing a crisis with the war in Syria and the crystallization of sharp cleavages in uh, Yemen and Libya, 
The question is whether political engineering is at all possible in the region. So the, uh, in 2011, there was this short-lived uh, enthusiastic wave in academia which focused on the potential of democratization, yet it was soon eclipsed by older paradigms and perspectives on resilient authoritarianism. So central to these scholarly dilemmas is the uneasy relationship between sectarian fragmentation, institutionalism, and also the legacy of Arab states' inefficient governance. Um, so a scholarly trend that is positioned beyond the debate of transitions to democracy versus transitions to authoritarianism uh, has raised the questions whether forms of governance based on power sharing constitute realistic options to mitigate uh, tensions and exit wars um, in the post-2011 Middle East. So the argument is that since almost all Arab states are heterogeneous, political governance ought to reflect the structure of their society through the design of pluralist arrangements. Uh, so what's power sharing? From a theoretical perspective, the broad umbrella of power sharing studies draws on the typology of democratic regimes described as the consociational democracy model. Without delving too much into political theory, I would just like to attract your attention that this model was developed during the 1960s by the Consociationalist Fathers, namely Arendt Leiphardt, and later on, or more recently, by Brendan O'Larry. So this type of democracy foresees the devolution of power among communities, and it aims to expand prospects for democratic stability and conflict resolution. In his seminal book on democracy in plural societies, Leiphardt identifies four devices for consociational democracy, a grand elite coalition that represents different communities, mutual veto that allows communities to contest decisions that are opposed to their interests, proportionality in political representation, and the community's right to uh, run their own affairs. And the Lebanese case was one of the cases that grounded the consociational uh, democracy model in the 1960s. Um, however, consociationalism has many critics. So anti-consociationalists have criticized the model on the grounds that it deepens divisions and empowers elites over the masses. Uh, still, there is consensus generally in literature that power sharing agreements can be the most benign political forms after identity-based disruptions, be they racial, ethnic, or religious, and that they fit best when they are used as temporary settlements that would give away with time to more integrative forms of governance. So after the 2011 uprising, several scholars and policymakers have debated the relevance of power sharing uh, for uh, uh, post-Arab spring states. The argument for introducing power sharing in many post-2011 deeply divided Arab polities is strongly policy-oriented and rooted in the Arab world's context-specific realities. So indeed, if we analyze what has happened in the last years, we see that recent policy attempts at forming national uh, unity in governments uh, um, in uh, Iraq, Yemen, Lebanon, or Libya had to account for different communal groups' interests. And the failure to design modes um, in order uh, to um, include everybody has really reinforced communal grievances and resulted in new forms of communal authoritarianisms in countries such as post-2011 Bahrain, Yemen, and Libya. And according to the Uppsala Conflict Data Program in 2014, and this is the year which has witnessed the highest number of conflicts since 1999, Arab states such as Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Egypt, and Syria were a key terrain in the world for either intrastate or restarted conflict over government control. We also witnessed that since 2011 in the region, large-scale displacement in the region has furthermore been primarily induced by intrastate conflicts. So within this climate, local, regional, and international actors have started associating the notion of power sharing with inclusive or pluralist governance and conflict alleviation. For instance, the Arab League has stressed over and over again the importance of inclusive governments. The European Union in its 2016 global strategy envisions resilience building for the southern uh, neighborhood as a crucial method of conflict management. Resilience, according to the EU, means, among other things, pluralist government. Uh, pluralist governance, i.e. engaging and strengthening civil society youth, but also religious communities. Similarly, the UN has pushed for power sharing between warring parties in Libya and Syria as prospects for conflict resolution. And yet, while power sharing 
Um, inclusive governance and conflict alleviation in Arab societies have evolved into key political concern, policy concerns. Many academics have warned against their consequences and have questioned the issue of power sharing as a quick fix solution. Cautious arguments in literature are both theory-based and empirical. Theoretically, little, little do we know really about forms of political systems that can consolidate peace in the Arab world and that go beyond politicized sectarianism or what we call sectarian ethnicity. Furthermore, empirically speaking, the application of sectarian power sharing arrangements in the light of the post-2003 uh, Iraqi example has left a bitter taste. So against this backdrop, uh, since the onset of the 2011 Arab revolt, <coughs> scholars and policymakers have taken a renewed interest in the Lebanese case as a model that could inspire political solutions in divided societies, such as Syria for the moment. So focus is essentially placed on understanding the extent to which Lebanon could help us to understand the dangers but also the benefits of power sharing. And uh, yet which lessons can we learn from Lebanon's legacy of sectarian power sharing? So as we all know, uh, Lebanon's pre-war system, as I said, was often praised as an exceptionally functional case of consociational democracy. Still, with the outbreak of the war in 1975, attention tur turned to the danger that a system that institutionalizes sectarian identities within rigid political structures may trigger. So since, since the end of the war in uh, 1990, social scientists worldwide began to characterize Lebanon's <coughs> political of sectarianism through the lens of conflict rather than coexistence. Uh, my aim for this talk is not to make generalizations from the Lebanese case to the post-Arab spring societies. Rather, I would like to uh, raise uh, some preliminary reflections on how power sharing or consociational models, despite ending and juggling conflicts, entrench in practice uh, several dilemmas and trade-offs. One important dilemma that I'm going to focus on today is the dilemma or trade-off between the politics of power sharing, the politics of inclusion, and the politics of democratization. In some of my writings, I have developed, with regards to the Lebanese case, the concept of illiberal power sharing or consociationalism, a system I argue has developed in Lebanon in the last decades. By an illiberal power sharing system, I mean a system which devolves power among communities, yet first requires trade-offs between the embedding of democratization and the consolidation of peace. Second, a system that entrenches the supremacy of, or rule of elites at the expense of public deliberation and grassroots forms of governance. And third, a system that invites, uh, that invites sorry, to the, its dependence on external brokerage, outside actors to shape the outcomes of internal conflicts. So if we disaggregate the relationship between power sharing, inclusion, and democratization in Lebanon, we can certainly identify various areas of concern or tensions. What are these areas of concern? And how does Lebanon's politics of power sharing impose restrictions on democratization and inclusive governance? Um, firstly, an analysis of post-war political developments shows that power sharing in Lebanon puts elite bargaining and squabbling at the forefront, undermining constitutional deadlines, institutions, and most importantly, the role of ordinary people in driving democratization processes. So a dominant feature of Lebanon's post-war political life has been elite feuding. Negotiation and dialogue processes turn into sticks and carrots to delay decision-making, extract sectarian-based concessions, or further interests. Uh, since 2005, a central feature of Lebanon's politics has been the rise of a divisive model of power sharing separating the 14 versus the 8 March coalitions. So unsolved debates separating both factions and revolving around a wide array of contentious uh, issues such as Hezbollah's weapons or the Special Tribunal for Lebanon led to various cabinet breakdowns and to long cycles <coughs> of political deadlock. And Lebanon's power sharing uh, makeup system is not really equipped to, to actively diffuse such crises and the, and the issues that are contentious remain until today either active or dormant, waiting to be awakened. Um, <clears throat> secondly, elite infighting on the one hand and the tendency towards polarization along sectarian lines that the system entrenches on the other have systematically undermined two important features of democratic transition processes. First, electoral sequencing and constitutional deadlines. 
Illustrative cases are countless. A case in a point is the postponement of parliamentary elections since 2013 in the light of Lebanon's entanglement in the Syrian crisis and internal divisions over the Syrian war. Policymakers argued back then that Lebanon's precarious security and polarization patterns would potentially politicize electoral outcomes and destabilize the country. This has happened, although many observers said that Lebanon has previously convened elections under more turbulent circumstances. So the issue here is that when there is regional turmoil or government overload, Lebanon's history shows that elites tend to prioritize what I call a freezing of the political order, which has adverse effects on driving the politics of democratization and political liberalization processes. Um, another important trait of illiberal trait of Lebanon's power sharing that I would like to allude to very briefly is that elite-led politics remains really disconnected from grassroots forms of politics or politics from below, namely from public deliberative spheres and popular mobilization such as protest movements. So in recent years, the, as we all know, the postponement of elections and the garbage crisis sparked protests and vociferous public debates over the Lebanese state inability to navigate such challenges. Still, there hasn't been any transparent initiative of deliberation between politicians and public spheres with a view to discussing such failures. Furthermore, much research has uh, shown that Lebanon's rigid form of power sharing does not allow non-sectarian movements such as LGBTQ movements to demand equality and rights within sectarian power sharing institutions. Um, so, um, adding to this, the fact that political leaders have to retain a certain level of control in their respective communities constrains popular mobilization. So, the sectarian system uh, indirectly deters collective protests because it spells trouble for quiet sectarian dynamics. So, this is also a very important trade-off. Um, one last uh, area of concern that I would like to talk about is Lebanon's dependence on external actors or brokers that the system itself reinforces. So sectarian politics feeds to a great extent on foreign alliances through which communities compete for control over resources. And this form of governance also furthermore invites part partisanship in external conflicts. In recent years, internal tensions over uh, in Lebanon over the Arab uprisings and particularly over Syria's conflict have to be read in the context of Lebanon's political groupings clashing loyalties vis-a-vis -vis regional actors. So this is not to deny for the, the ones who actually advocate uh, power sharing in Lebanon that Lebanon has had, that the Lebanese system has had some relative benefits. Um, in a turbulent region, it is actually very important to add that following the uncertain post-2011 Arab transformations, there is renewed interest in exploring the benefits of Lebanon's consociationalism. The fact that Arab political systems or uh, um, post-Arab spring states have not been able to come up with alternative political systems or success stories, um, you know, have prompted analysts and practitioners worldwide to talk about the relative benefits of the Lebanese system. Some scholars have, for example, stressed its relative social resilience and capacity to maintain a minimally functional political <coughs> life when regional turmoil uh, uh, exacerbates. Uh, notwithstanding this, and here I reach some uh, concluding statements, I have tried to show in my presentation that Lebanon's power sharing system works against various features that are essential for democracy, inclusion, resilience to external conflicts, and most importantly, ownership of ordinary citizens over political life. So power sharing appears like a quite seductive option because it allows for a quick and good enough arrangement. Indeed, if we review like power sharing agreements worldwide, we see that it has really allowed for bringing warring factions together, and it has allowed for a quick transitioning uh, 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 from the war. Yet this good enough uh, arrangement could be quite costly, and we have many examples in uh, the Muslim world, for example in Iraq, applying extreme power sharing uh, designs namely federalism under international monitoring has led to polarizing ethnicity. In Afghanistan as well, the institutional choice was a centralized government. Um, however, informal power sharing arrangements have been introduced. These informal arrangements over time have reinforced the position of certain ethnic groups 
at the expense of others and have also spurred insurgencies. We furthermore have um, evidence from worldwide cases that power sharing relies on external brokerage and facilitates in external intervention. In Iraq and Afghanistan, just like in Lebanon, institutionalizing pluralism has necessitated the brokerage of external parties, be they international organizations or states. Oftentimes, these powers have interest in shaping internally the outcomes of conflicts and uh, domestic interests. So power sharing, all in all, can be seen as an efficient crisis management technique to initiate a transition. However, the arising question is, how does it affect negatively peace and democracy in the long run? So uh, does this mean that power sharing as a debate in this conference should be discarded as an option for Lebanon, but also for, for some Arab states? Um, the answer is no. And this is what I'm trying to prove in my research, provided that power sharing is not purely organized along sectarian lines. Here are some questions that I would like to leave you with. In the wake of the Arab uprisings, can we imagine the Arab world beyond the ethno-sectarian model? Can we dissociate our understanding of power sharing from arrangements that are based purely on sectarianism? If so, how? This spurs for me in additional questions. What are other potential methods for sharing or dividing power? How to strengthen, for example, power sharing from below through forms of deliberative and local forms of governance that are not strictly associated with ethnicity? Um, recent literature has started exploring in divided societies such as Bosnia-Herzegovina or in India how uh, neighborhoods, wor workplaces, and common economic interests can actually help to craft societal bonds that go beyond identity-based networks. Can we carry out more research on this line of thought in Lebanon and more broadly in the Arab world? So one line of inquiry that I'm currently uh, developing um, in, my, uh, in one of my articles is that uh, to, to actually to reimagine power sharing in Lebanon and the Arab world otherwise. Uh, so power sharing as an integrative tool that could facilitate cross-community decision making through putting in place, for example, sectarian blind institutions or issue-based parties. Uh, so the aim is that sectarian power sharing, as Timothy Sisk says, you know, can wither over time and disappear and give away to democratic systems in which ethnicity or sectarianism become depoliticized. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tammy. We, uh, we move uh, straight away to Sami Atalla. Uh, Sami is the director of the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, and he's currently leading several policy studies on the uh, performance of the parliament, political and social sectarianism, the electoral behavior of voters, and more recently, role of municipalities in dealing with the refugee crisis, among other political economy challenges for facing Lebanon. He's author and co-author and editor and co-editor of a number of, uh, of publications coming from the LCPS and elsewhere. And uh, also, Sami was part of the committee that uh, was established by the Lebanese Prime Minister to draft a decentralization Look. So, Sami, also for 12 to 15 minutes, and then we'll move to Thank you, Nasser, and um, thank you for the invitation, and of course for the Baker Institute and for IFI, um, and for a very inclusive panel. <laughs> uh, speaking of inclusivity, <laughs> absolutely, especially because of. Um, Khalil, but really, it's, it's wonderful to be here. And I think the sort of the context that I was sort of struggling with when I was sort of preparing for this, because you know, when you're in Lebanon and you're sort of living the day in, day out sectarianism and sort of the state and so forth, and then it's kind of a sort of a fresh way to rethink where we are, particularly when we zoom out and look at the um, the Arab world and and this initiative by the Baker um, Center to think of how to build a pluralistic and inclusive uh, society. And of course, this comes from what we're living in right now in the Arab world, where after seven or eight years, we're ending up with either sort of many states have collapsed or some states have re sort of configured their authoritarianism. So we end up sort of with those two sort of models and in between you've got Lebanon, uh, whereby uh, as a result of the rise of sectarianism um, uh, in many of these conflicts, whether Syria, Iraq, Bahrain and, and elsewhere, um, Lebanon sort of, you know, 
I don't want to use the word shines, but becomes a model to consider. Um, and uh, obviously with a sort of implicit assumption as if our differences um, are only or predominantly sectarian. So if that's the case, then uh, looking at Lebanon makes a lot of sense. Uh, but if that's not the case, then we're um, in trouble, I think, you know, because uh, uh, our differences probably are much more complex than being reduced to sectarianism. So in any case, I thought it would be useful to sort of um, take this occasion and look at Lebanon, which has um, maybe spearheaded the sort of institutionalization of sectarianism in the last 100 plus years, uh, as you very well know, and I think as Tamir Ras sort of has uh, very nicely talked about the theoretical sort of foundations. But essentially, um, this sort of um, evolution of the system from the 1860 or 1864 in terms of building sort of the state and the institutions that are actually sectarian have sort of a long or have come a long way. Now, I'd like to argue that um, actually in the last maybe 12 or 13 years, particularly after the uh, withdrawal of Syria, um, that the system has actually fared well, relatively well, when it comes to security. You know, surprisingly, Lebanon has not imploded. Surprisingly, the political actors have actually managed to resolve conflict despite high level of polarization. March 8, March 14, and then they moved on to assassinations, bombs, killings, uh, Syria's war, intervention in Syria. Some parties went to Syria to protect Lebanon. Some said, no, stay in Lebanon to protect Lebanon. Two very different views of the world. But in fact, uh, surprisingly and impressively, they've actually managed to you know, hold the boat. And that's actually. Uh, I would argue that's because it preserved their interest you know, to do that, because there is definitely uh, an understanding that the rules of the game, despite all our political differences, we need to maintain it. However, I would argue that despite that, um, the system has hollowed out any meaning to deliver any public goods for citizens on any socioeconomic dimensions. So we have, on one hand, system working relatively well on security issues, but when it actually comes to um, socioeconomic issues, it actually has failed. And, uh, and, and there's no, actually, it's not surprising, and because there are no incentives, actually, for the system to deliver. Uh, and just very briefly, I mean, electoral laws are designed in such a way to undermine any sense of accountability from the people, from the voter. So the electoral law is actually is designed in such a way that they choose their constituency versus uh, voters electing the representatives. And also, once they're elected, there's no any accountability mechanism left in place. So whether it's about the parliament or oversight agencies or the judiciary, the sort of undermine or even labor unions to do so. So we ended up with sort of, you know, these political fiefdoms of uh, sec taking sectarian veil or nature that has kept the system sort of working. And I also feel like, uh, just so before I sort of um, start showing some, some figures, um, that we often too much focus on representation. You know, building inclusive states, pluralism, pluralistic society. And I think it comes at the expense of accountability. And as long as there's no accountability system in place, in any society for that matter, and it becomes much more complex in a, in a, in a, in a sectarian one or sectarian-based political system, then we're, we're in trouble. And then we're going to see that now because I'm going to um, discuss and show. Um, this is, by the way, part, uh, part of many studies that LCBS has been um, und undergoing. And um, obviously, it's an occasion to thank all my team at LCPS. And uh, there, there are too many to actually name. But May is here, so I'm going to give also May some credit. I have helped out in putting this. And I'm going to resort to different sort of studies. And I'm going to sort of construct them to make the argument how it has been hollowed out. Um, and as well as other people, like Laura Paylor and others, we've worked together on these issues. But I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll roll some data just to go into the more the micro stuff. So what I'm going to do, can I have the? I sure. guess there is a moment. Where is that? Oh, I'm hiding it. Um, let's see. OK. OK, so I'm going to look at three things. I'm going to look at citizens' preferences. I'm, I'm going to, these three things actually meant to say. Look, first of all, are really citizens divided on sectarian issues? You know, 
And I'm going to show very, very quickly and very briefly that their differences are actually not based on secondary beliefs or attitudes or views on many things are not. Two, I'm going to actually talk about the connection between the MPs and citizens, you know what I mean, to, in terms of are they able to meet their, their uh, relationships. So that's more sort of the vertical relationship. And then I'm going to sort of highlight, wait a minute, do, do really political leaders have a clue of what they want to do? So very quickly, I'm, I'm going to resort to many surveys that we've done of citizens, we've done experimental stuff, survey of MPs. So I'm going to resort to all of these um, uh, sort of uh, background work that we've been doing. But essentially, um, and this is sort of a, a relatively old study a couple of years ago, where we actually took a survey and we looked at how people actually answered these questions. You know, a survey of 2,000 people, and we said, look, let's do some statistical work and see to what extent, you know, are these differences real, you know? And in fact, we, we show, and I think if I press this button, something should happen, yes, it does give you a red dot, that religion and sect are really not the most salient, you know what I mean? I'm not terribly surprised because that was my hunch. When it comes to women's issues and so forth, they were. When when it came to economic issues, income was really particularly important. So people from different economic class had different views on the economy, had nothing to do with sectarianism here. Education was also important to explain other things. You know? Not terribly, I think, surprising for, for most, but I thought it was a good sort of warm-up. However, we actually interviewed the MPs, and we interviewed 65 MPs who actually accepted to see us. And we interviewed and surveyed 2,496 people, and we said, OK, same question. What are the key priorities of the country? And we want to see what sort of alignment between what the MPs say and what citizens say to see sort of what sort of gap. And here we are. The red is citizens, and the orange is uh, the MPs. And you see in the top seven problems or issues by citizens, they are predominantly socioeconomic in nature, except for terrorism. But you can see increase in prices, unemployment, education, electricity. And then you jump to um, solid waste. Whereas MPs had different priorities. I think they've, there are three that actually concurred to both. But you know, essentially unemployment, OK, they actually do think unemployment is very important, which is very interesting. And keep that in mind, because I'm going to get back to that. Um, also, education costs, they mention it. Uh, terrorism, they're worried about it. But they're more concerned about electoral reform <coughs> and fighting corruption, you know what I mean, as MPs. Well, it's very noble of them, but that's important. Now, um, but I said, you might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, that's really not accurate because you have to look at the Sunnis, citizens, and Sunni MPs, and the Shia MPs and the Shias, you know, so we do this kind of work, you know, just for the fun of it, and we also see, come up with this, uh, this is what citizens think, and this is what the MPs think, and basically, if, uh, if they are, have equal uh, sort of perception of the problems, then we should be on the 45 degree line. But we're not. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I think I'll go to the Q&A because I'd love to show more stuff rather than stop on this. But it clearly shows that in the Maronite community, that's not the case. In the Sunni community, you've got diversion. In the Shia community, you have also some diversions between what the people say and what citizens say. Now, but we say, OK, wait a minute. This is what they said. But let's look at the laws, right? I mean, there are 352 laws that were passed between 2009 and um, April uh, 2017. So we go through these laws to show actually to what extent these laws meet what the people said are key problems. Because at the end of the day, it's really the laws that matter. And guess what? Actually, when we looked at these laws, every single law, we found out that only 31 law actually pertain to what people's needs are. And in fact, more than that, out of those 31, 26 were either presented by ministries or international organizations where they've actually prepared the law, and the MP or the parliament has just to approve them. So there's even little effort to actually even think of uh, problems or issues uh, to deal with citizens' concerns. Am I going too fast just because I feel I'm about to, you know, I need to go fast. Thank you. Thank you for confirming that. All right. So, so we took all the deliberations. We said, okay, maybe, maybe they couldn't get the laws, you know, the right laws, but they've really talked about people's concerns. So we took all the deliberations, right? And Parliament, and we sort of said, let's see the frequency of actually stating these things. To what extent they actually talk about people's concerns? And when you look at it, you see, well, you know, war with Israel, and Israel is sort of, you know, an issue, judicial system. And then well, let's look for unemployment. Can you find unemployment? Oh my God, I can't find it. It's right here, unemployment, right? Right that you see it here, that tiny thing. So clearly, when unemployment is such an important concern for people, and it's barely mentioned in Parliament, that tells you what the priorities are. In fact, if you look at what they talk about, a lot of it's about security. 
which going back to what I said earlier, how they actually work very well on security issues. You know? So in any case, to move on, um, I do admit this is not the most beautiful graph I've ever produced, but I thought I'll share it in any case. We asked them about unemployment. We said, OK, but do they know people's problems? Do they know what the unemployment rate in this country? Because you know, as an MP, you know. So uh, the green is the ones who got it right. And Look, I know, I know, there are no unemployment figures that are accurate, so we give them a 10% margin. <laughs> I mean, 15 to 25. If you said that, I'll give you a yes. Uh, but guess what? Uh, what's actually fascinating about this is not that they only got, many got it wrong. It's actually how many overestimated <laughs> unemployment, which I find like this kind of, those people thought, five people thought it was 50%, which is crazy. As a 50%, the country would have collapsed, right? You know? uh, but also, uh, yeah. Anyway, so we also know about poverty, and this is what a lot of them underestimated poverty. It was actually very interesting. So they've overestimated unemployment, underestimated poverty, making no link that if you have high unemployment, you'll have high poverty, but that's another case. Um, so then we move on just to, so you know, this confessional thing. In Parliament, we have 35 MPs, Maronite MPs. The 23 of them are in six, six parties. parties. So clearly, those MPs are not in one party, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we've got 11 independent, sorry, no, 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 11 non-affiliated, not independent. But in any case, I'll, I'll, I could come back to this uh, later on. What we did here, we actually interviewed the 65 MPs on policy issues, because now I'm going to move to see whether those MPs are actually do they, I mean, we know now, I've established that there's really very weak link, if no link at all, between citizens and politicians, but now do the MPs Political parties in power, do they have similar views on things? Do they have an, a, a socio-economic agenda? So, um, and let me sort of skip this to show you, for example. So we took, for example, the Future Movement block, um, uh, but Khalil, I have other parties as well. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so we asked some questions on the administrative decentralization, productive sectors, and rental law. I took three out of the, we have 15 policy questions. But just to show you, when we interviewed them, uh, we asked them whether they feel like, for example, are they at this end of the spectrum where the Qatar Council should have very limited authority, or they think the Qatar Council should have more authority, right? And we thought that by doing that, we actually get a sense of where this party or bloc's position on this. Um, and then we asked them the same thing about productive sectors, same thing about the rental law of 2014. And just to show you the fact that there are uh, across, throughout the spectrum, that tells me there's no party sort of position on this. Everyone has his, his or her own position. So clearly there's um, no party, really, in that sense. And this, if you look at, I'm going to skip here, I do the same thing for the change and reform. We interviewed, again, you see there throughout. You know, some are for, uh, some are against, some are for, some are in the middle. And then we do this for the loyalty to the resistance. Again, this group actually, in relative terms, they were more coherent. This is the group led by Hezbollah in terms of uh, coherence. And then if I go back to the very, very position here where we ranked them, in fact, we said, who has the highest? Hezbollah had 9 point something or 9.7 out of 15. But still, they agree on 9 to, or 10 issues out of 15, whereas the change early form agree on 7 issues out of 15. So every other issue, there's some sort of agreement. So, so clearly... Three minutes. Three minutes, very good, thank you. So, but wait a minute, maybe, maybe it's really not about the political parties. I mean, at the end of the day, maybe it's sort of this confessionalism that's kicking in. So we decided to do the same, sorry, to do the same thing. Um, I skipped, I went overboard. And we do the same exercise by looking at the Maronite. Let's take all the Maronite MPs. Do the Maronite MPs have the same position on policy issues? We sort of place them here and but we also get a very sort of dispersion of policies and positions. We do the same thing for the Sunni MPs. We do the same thing for the Shia MPs, and we measure them. We end up also very little out of, by looking at it from a sectarian or confessional perspective, you see seven or eight out of 15 policies they agree on. So clearly, there's, no matter how you spin it, whether by political party, or by sectarianism, you end up actually with no policy agenda on socio-economic issues, no matter, no matter how you spin it. So, almost finally, so we decided to do this fun thing, and we said, okay, like, for those who have policy positions, who should be with whom? Assume if you want to set up programmatic party, you know what I mean? So you end up, you end up with, with um, 
with, for example, the blue is a future, the orange, uh, the, the, the free patriotic movement, the yellow is Hezbollah, and so forth. And we came up with six groups. So this is what, if, you, if Lebanon is based on programmatic parties, these are the six parties that should be together. And what's really nice is that you see that, you know, they should be, they're, they're, they're really, you know, they have similar views. So I'm going to skip the fear factor because one thing, well, I should say, we realize, so how is this all maintained? And you say, well, you know, they keep on electing them and, you know, these people, what's going on? Citizens should go and vote for, uh, you know, young groups, you know, energetic, and we already have one candidate here, vote for Gilbert, for example, <laughs> because those guys have a serious agenda. Um, and one thing we, we, we noticed when we did the study, uh, we did an experimental survey with Laura Paylor at the University of Pittsburgh in Lebanon where we gave them a, a petition to, say, to sign. And we said this petition is to abolish sectarianism, all these things that secular demands are. And we randomized this. We gave some group uh, the petition. We said, if you sign it, it will become public. And another group, we said, if you sign it, it becomes private. It's, it, your name will never be released. And then once you, you group you move from the public to the when you compare the two, there's a 20% drop that people don't want to re reveal their sort of position on this. So, and we show how actually fear is an important factor, but essentially, can I put this second? So I thought maybe I'll end on a sort of, um, how, how do I click one of these? Click. Or? Click. Sorry. Easily, you can click easily. From, click. Uh, the second one, I think, is, is better, maybe. Click, click, click. Hey, so the, this sort of, in terms of putting our sort of um, work as a center, we thought that all this is nice to put all these sort of work and papers and books and what have you. Um, so one way to sort of, we thought we need to communicate this. Um, so we thought we actually produce but it's not coming out. <laughs> so it's one of the results of the internet. internet. <laughs> <laughs> Does it work? Slowest internet in the world. Exactly. No. <laughs> so can you click the other one? You, you want the f Facebook or YouTube? Hey, anyone, anyone. Any, okay. I think Facebook would uh, no. be connected. Zabatit. Uh, okay, can you just say, yeah, sure. that would be lovely, can you? See more. Oh, we have to log in. Uh, no, no, I shouldn't. Not, okay. not the, what we'll do, we'll try the YouTube. YouTube. We need, we need volume. But in any case, while Muhammad is working, I, I, I can still occupy the uh. airwaves. Uh, and just say that um, we obviously, by doing this kind of exercise, we took the work of the parliament was very serious, the, and the political parties that occupy it, and to really subject them to scrutiny, because at the end of the day, we felt this is the institution that's supposed to monitor the government, and we ought to, to monitor the monitors and figure out really what, are they, what, what they're really doing at the end of the day. Um, and hence, when we felt that by doing so, creating a website, writing a book, and write articles, and what have you, may not necessarily be the best way to communicate these ideas to people. You know, so uh, so we decided to resort to sort of an animated movie that sort of really synthesizes you know these key findings in such a way that we could inform citizens at least those who are actually willing to sort of view this and look at the election maybe this time in a different way. Um, yeah, Ahmed, how are we doing? أقر مجلس النواب الحالي 352 قانون بثمان سنين واحدة وثلاثين بس بيتعلق مباشرة بالخدمات الأساسية اللي بتهم المواطنين مثل الصحة، التعليم، الماء والكهرباء. ثلاثة وأربعين بالمية من النواب ما قدموا ولا قانون خلال ثمان سنوات. وأغلب اللجان النيابية اللي شغلتها تناقش هيد الأوانين اجتمعت معدل نص اجتماع بالشهر. البرلمان شغلته يراقب عمل الحكومة خاصة بوقت الأزمات الكبيرة. بس منطق المسائلة غايب لأن الأحزاب الممثلة بالبرلمان هي ذاتها موجودة بالحكومة وبحسب النواب هن بيقضوا 70% من وقتهم يا على الإعلام يا عم بيستقبلوا ناخبين يا على نشاطات سياسية مختلفة وهالشي بكرس الزبائنية بعلاقة النايب بالناخب 30% من وقتهم بس بيروح على التشريع والرقابة إذا قررنا نطلع دفتر علامات للنواب على مشاركتهم بالنقاشات واقتراح القوانين بيطلع معدل المجلس 4.3 على 10 ومع هيدا كله النائب عم بيزيد مخصصاته وتعويضاته من المال العام آخر 8 سنين هددونا وخوفونا من الفراغ
وتحجج فيه ليمددوا لنفسهم مرتين بطريقه غير شرعيه، بس احنا فعليا كنا عايشين بفراغ، كلفنا 352 مليار ليره لبنانيه، ورغم كل هالفشل نوابنا اليوم ما عندهم اي مشكله يرجعوا يمددوا لنفسهم. I guess on this note I'll end and give Nasser the floor because thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Sami. Um, an animated presentation <laughs> with an animation <laughs> showing the state of affairs. And we'll move actually to Dr. Khalil Jbara. Khalil uh, is currently the head of the Good Governance Unit. Yeah. This, this is kind of, I think, it's an ad a dated uh, 90s. Uh, bio. I know Khalil is the now policy advisor or senior advisor to the Minister of, in, of, of Interior or Internal Affairs and Municipalities in Lebanon, Mr. Mishnu. And he's been uh, with the government in different uh, positions, uh, serving as advisor to a number of uh, units and uh, in, in a number of, uh, of uh, programs. So, but previously, uh, Khalil served as executive director of the Lebanese Transparency Association, Transparency International Chapter in Lebanon. He was also secretary general of the Arab Region Parliamentarians Against Corruption, a non-governmental organization located in Beirut. He holds PhD and he's a lecturer in AUB as well. Khalil, we'll give you 15 minutes as well. I will speak from here then. Okay. Thanks, Nasser. Uh, yeah, yeah. I feel that uh, my presence here is maybe to say something that will go against the flow. I mean, it seems that, I mean, so it's good always not to, uh, I mean, so it's, it might be better not to perform a panel where everybody's talking to themselves about it. Let's, let's do it. Uh, let's try to, to put some concrete, uh, very practical things on the table at least, or at least from my position since uh, 2009, where I, I have been involved and witnessed how the system really functions. And I think that uh, what we need to make sure that maybe this panel might not uh, be able to articulate well is the management of expectations. What I just heard from colleagues is that maybe what the system should be, or but it's not about what the system is. So let's agree on that. So. Uh, I mean, with all our respect to the numbers given by Sami and its importance, at the end of the day, uh, if you really dive in the consociational Lebanese system, we'll know that MPs are not the decision makers, and we know that the MPs are not involved in making policies. So whether MPs knows what they are doing, whether they don't know what they are doing, whether they attend meetings, they don't attend meetings, that's not the case. Let's be very clear. This is why I say I hope that I put some practical things on the table. That's not what the MPs are there to do. Uh, and actually, even if you go back to the real foundation of the constitutional nature of the Lebanese system, Okay, MPs are not the real decision makers because the system is simply based on, it's, a, it's an elitist system based on co cooperation between the elite. It is not a system, I mean, if we are mistaken that the Lebanese system, and this is a model if you wanna export to Syria or other places, if you are mistaken by thinking Lebanon is a system about uh, parliament functioning or about uh, uh, parliament producing legislations that uh, and this is not the Lebanese system. So let's talk, let's decide in which system we are referring to. Uh, this is, I think, that simply because, and actually this is all fit beautifully within the literature of consociational system. Because consociational system, and I will tell you in a bit later where it differs really. Consociational system is mostly about coming up with the two parallel system. An official system that has a constitution that speaks about rights, speaks about national identities, speak about uh, other institutions, and a parallel system. And here we need to highlight the term, uh, the parallel system that speaks about elite cooperation. This parallel system is based on norms. And this is, so if we go back to the Lebanese system, 
And if you go back to the Lebanese political system from its serious foundation, 40s until now, it's still functioning on the norms rather than it's functioning on the official constitution. We can argue, and that's a very fair discussion, how come the system did not move from, did not move beyond the norms. And this is, I think, where the literature and the Lebanese system is in contradiction, because the whole model of consociational system is based on a transitory phase that it leads to build stability, what Sami was talking about. And then from stability, you move on to more solid constitutional institutions that functions on terms of governance of institutions. The Lebanese system, the norms and the consociation and the agreement became the end by itself rather than it's a mean to build for something else. And this is, if you want to articulate and define and argue about the Lebanese political system, we have to accept that this is its realities. Whether we, whether we believe in it. So in this case, issues about parliamentarians, about efficiency of institutions are not, they got downgraded on the list of issues. We are next week, uh, the official elections period starts in Lebanon. It's 5th of February, is the announcement of the election campaign period. Today, the country is full of opinion polls. Uh, and in my, where I sit in my office, I receive, let's say, on, on it becomes a kind of a, a very bad habit of looking at these numbers. Yes, when you talk to citizens, yes. And all the opinion polls we saw for the past four years, at least since 2014, the first three issues becomes electricity and internet. This is the first, and jobs, the third item. Syrian refugees are not on the top three or four, and uh, you can ask the colleagues of NDI about this, is they are not in the top three. It's always electricity, internet, and jobs. Not Syrian refugees, by the way. Unlike what the public or what the politicians speak about Syrian refugees on a daily basis. But the question is, then let's talk about, are these issues, they gonna be the issues that gonna decide the results of the elections? Is the perfor electricity performance or internet, are they gonna derive? No, okay, and this is what's making today the system in Lebanon looks very unstable because, uh, because elite is suffering from lack of cooperation on one side and is suffering from uh, from the serious, the serious, how to say, ammunition that will create this kind of divisions. And here I'm gonna speak about this so I can go to the point, explain the point clearly. The Lebanese constitutional model that is very rigid in its nature and built on a cartel of cooperation, and here is the emphasis on the word cartel to refer to the elitist nature of the system, okay? can functions without day-to-day -day frictions by either relying on what we call it, uh, by relying on a foreign or a regional power kind of mediating or having an influence on Lebanon, and this is the Pax Syriana that we witnessed, I mean, because the Syrian presence in Lebanon provided two things to the system. They took off from the system the, the, the conflict over the international sphere. So Lebanon lost any ability to decide on international and regional politics, unlike today where the system is divided over regional and international th uh, topics and themes. And second, the Syrian system, through manipulation, through different electoral law, they ensured on creating what I call it competition within the communities. Because the Lebanese system, when it reached polarization between communities, it st stopped functioning. Again, as we are seeing over the past, as we saw many times since 2008, it stopped functioning. This is why the basic model for this system to function with all my, and I'm sorry if this is not uh, a very kind of uh, modern way of thinking about it, the system to function properly needs to ensure competition within sectary within the sects because any polarization leads to conflict between the sects so if you go back again over the past 2005 and today you would see level you and you put on the side kind of the polarization of the sects and conflict you would see it's at speak when sects are being polarized 
And this is something very important that people fail to, to argue about. Maybe the current electoral law, I mean, I know that it doesn't have a lot of fans, but maybe the, the minimum amount of proportional representation with this electoral so system might be one of the entry points for a, for a more institutionalized of stability by creating the minimum amount of, uh, of competition within the sex. So this is this is the real uh, this is the real model is hence if you look at the major issues today in the country the Lebanese are divided over Syrian issue because the Lebanese system fails to cope with the crisis like Syria fails to cope with the crisis like Syria like it failed throughout history to fail to cope with any any major issue and again this is part of this of the so called and without giving it a positive connotation of the success of the syrian regime to impose stability because it took off the system any ability to argue or to decide or to talk about regional or international politics and it, it forced this competition within the sect so these are the two for the since let's say in the 90s this is the going back to the issue of the 90s this is the pax syriana model of the P syrian peace over lebanon based on these two fundamental issues, and which allowed or showed the system some kind of stability and quietness over that. And since 2005, part of the problems have been that these two issues came back to the Lebanese system. One, the, ability, the inability or to behave with regional international challenges, challenges, one, and second, the polarization of the communities. So these are still the two things that determine the fate of the stability of the Lebanese political system, not uh, economic and social issues, not service delivery, not any things. These are the two things that really today, if you want to understand seriously the pluralistic nature of the Lebanese system, as, as Sami said, it's an institutionalized sectarian system, and stability is linked to these two things, to how much the, the foreign international regional affects the system, and second, how basically the, co the competition inside the communities, because the moment there is a monopoly within a community, it becomes against other communities. This is the practice, this is what, uh, if you really dive into the Bani system, you will come with these two conclusions. And here, let me give you an example, a practical example also about this. If you go back from the famous constitutional document of 1976, from the constitutional document of 1976, as incidents, until the latest of the past two years, approval of the budget and the approval of the new electoral law, you will come up with one simple conclusion including like, the Taif is uh, bef before and after the Taif, including the Dauha agreement or the tripartite agreement, all of these occasions, what you will conclude, you will conclude that all kind of negotiations, serious negotiations, are being done outside the institutions, are being done where? Outside the institutions, because at the end of the day, the institution serves for what? It serves to, office, to put an official stamp <coughs> over a process of negotiations that negotiations between representatives of the elite and institutions are not do not serve to provide policies and it's not a venue for discussion to reform the constitution or to approve a budget or to increase or decrease tax the institutions are there simply to make it an official process whereas the real discussions are done outside these official institutions. So when you look at this, then it becomes normal to argue the way I'm seeing it about how these, how these institutions and the systems and the themes are different from practice and, and literature, or if you want, what we like to have versus what they are exactly on the ground. I mean, not to be depressive in, in, in this way of thinking, the, one of the things, no, no, but I mean, we can, I'm, I'm ready, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really open to discuss this, but again, putting a touch of reality always is good, Yeah. One of the things I have been, since 2000, since the Doha agreement, okay, since I witnessed the discussions during, in the Doha agreement, I mean, Taif, I was 
I'm quite uh, very young, Yanni. Until today, I have been thinking always for the past years about, I mean, how to, how to institutionalize this informal engagement or discussions over the system. That's something that I have been really focusing on. At the end of the day, I mean, Sami was talking about parliamentarians. I will tell you for a fact that the parliamentarians who approved the electoral law did not see it until the morning. <laughs> yes, yes. And I will tell you that most parliamentary blocks, they receive before a session, they receive how to vote on every article. They have, so they don't have to read it, they don't have to know it, they receive. <laughs> and the lawyer or whoever drafts these laws are linked automatically with the leader of the parliamentary blocks, not with the individual piece. Because the, it's not because of incompetence by the parliamentarians. No, no, no. It's because the system functions different. This is how the nature of the system. So one of the things, so literally, literally, so we were discussing the electoral law because it was obvious that the one who knew it were not the ones who were discussing it over TV. Okay, and until now, and it's until now the same. This is why until now parliamentarians ask people like me questions about the law because they don't know it because they were not part of the discussion. Discussions is always done between the elite. This is the system of Lebanon. It's a co it's cooperation between an elite. It's not a system pluralistic system in nature of bottom up approach of governance system. So think about think about. Uh, this is why I we wrote. Uh, and Dr. Tari Mitri was involved in this process a few years ago, we really start working on coming up with a Senate. Because we believe, really, that a Senate is supposed to be the venue where you export to all of these issues that has a confessional nature or affect the sectarian nature, and leave the government and parliament to work on service delivery. So basically, the idea is to separate the issues of service delivery from the issues that has any kind of confessional nature. Hence, this is why uh, the idea of a Senate becomes more and more because a cooperation is becoming more and more difficult. Okay, you see it, cooperation is becoming more and more difficult. This is why we believe that a real discussion over the Senate that you export or you, you, you import to, if you want, if you want to put it differently, all these problems of confessional nature. Hence, it opened up the system for the institution to function how it's supposed to function in terms of service delivery. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Uh, took us into a trip of realism. <laughs> Let's go to some ide idealism. <laughs> uh, so we move to our first uh, speaker, uh, Gilbert Dumit. Uh, Gilbert is a founder and um, managing partner of Beyond Reform and Development Group, a social enterprise and consulting firm working to establish innovative, inclusive, and participatory policies and institutions in the MENA region, currently in 12 countries, and he's a strategy advisor, leadership consultant, and social entrepreneur. And uh, Gilbert has dedicated his work to meaningful transformation through policy innovation, institution strengthening, and capacity development for more than 20 years. And Gilbert is also uh, has announced his candidacy to uh, the, the, the parliament uh, in one of the Beirut districts, and under a group of what they call uh, transform civil society actors into political actors. <laughs> Thank you, Nasser. Uh, in fact, I'm running for the parliament to challenge the reality that Khalid just described. We'll see. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I was positively surprised that Khalil uh, described it well. I think he validated exactly what uh, what uh, Tamiras and Sam were saying about the the nature of this political system that has been. Um, uh, I think you explained extremely well how how the system has been paralyzing institutions and hasn't been able to produce anything, and how the, <laughs> the how, how this pluralistic the pluralistic nature of our political unsystem has been exclusionary for different groups in the country. And I like what Sami said before in terms of, and made us fragile towards uh, uh, regional interventions and making this country always volatile and fragile vis-a-vis -vis conflicts in the region. And in fact, it's, it's not only the civil war we've been living, we've been living wars over and over. And we've been seeing the last two days tells about the fragility of our, of our fake pluralism. 
So I'm going to build the argument on because because we're we're living in a world of fake things. So how we have how our our the the nature of our consociational um, uh, democracy, our power sharing system, how it's it's fake pluralism. It doesn't. So the outcome of it is very exclusionary. And I don't know who designed the session by saying pluralism and inclusion in Lebanon. I think it should it should have been pluralism and exclusion in Lebanon. And how pluralism could be exclusionary by nature. And it, it can exclude uh, 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 apparently or uh, 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 like su superficially, it is pluralism. Effectively, it's exclusionary of many groups, people, uh, um, citizens of uh, within the system. So discussing how, how our, so, so first I would like to start by looking at but on a on a very conceptual level, do people's identities, uh, the sense of identity, remain the same? Is it a static sense of identity people have vis-a-vis -vis communities, or is it uh, is it um, um, flexible? It changes over time. And looking at Lebanon recent history, how our our sectarian identities have been changing, and the intensity of them and the belonging has been very flexible based on alliances of the elite that Khalid was describing. And the second question is, when we're developing designing political order, are we looking at an an individual citizen state relation, or are we looking at groups relation with the state? Uh, the way the way we're we're conceiving the political order. How are we looking at individuals? Are we looking at the US as there are black and white, and these are groups, and we need to see how uh, we're going to represent them, how they're going to be represented in the system? Or are we looking, looking at them as individuals and not Latinos, black and white? So when we're conceiving the political order, how we're looking at it? We're not going to conceive any political order, in fact, in, in my presentation. But I want to argue how our, our pluralism is fake at all levels. So first, it's a fake consociational democracy, because our constitution, our formal system that was designed by a certain elite after, during Taif is in fact, is not a consociational democracy. And we're calling it in our common language, it's a civil state. So the informal system is a sectarian consociational democracy. Our, our uh, article nine in the constitution talks about the impartiality of the state vis-a-vis -vis all religions. We're not a state that wants to separate religion from the state. We're a state that wants to stay impartial vis-a-vis -vis all religions. So we believe in God. At the same time, we keep we're equidistant. The government's equidistant vis-a-vis -vis all religions. That's one. Second, we said like right after Taif and the first cabinet, we're going to elect a, a parliament that is um, uh, without representation of sects. So this is in our constitution, and our constitution was done by some elite by certain elite during then. Third, we said parallelly we're going to do the Senate. And the Senate represent the, 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 the confessions as a vehicle to make confession, uh, the, the different confession groups represented on issues of their concern. So, we, so we, yes, we designed participation of different confessions. At the same time, no, not at all levels of the state. And what is beautiful in our constitution is that Article 95 says, and we are going towards more and more impartiality through the, the, the Article 95, a national uh, 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 committee to eradicate confessionalism from across the system. And that's our constitution. And we, we uh, at Taif uh, Parliament, did it. So it's there. So this is why our consociational power sharing, sectarian power sharing system is a fake one, because the forum one is supposed to be this. And this is why it's every, most dialogues and most solutions happen ultra-institutionally, because our setup is supposed to function differently. Then why this reality is there? Is it because people's identities, people want to kill each other, and this is, and this is why our, our elite has been providing us with, with um, uh, uh, a service that uh, these identities can get, uh, revelate themselves anytime in a violent way and they're protecting us, or because it has been this fake, uh, this fake pluralistic model has been manipulated to avoid the implementation of the formal system. Otherwise, if, if we implement the formal system, they won't be. And I want to argue that it's a problem of the few and not the many. So there are few people who are benefiting from the system rather than uh, uh, the common citizens. 
So let, let's look at certain numbers, probably uh, Sami has, has put some. So yes, this system is allowing some uh, religion pluralism, means religion expression, but it has been excluding socially everyone. So 50% of women in this country feel excluded at, at all levels. So, uh, from, from politics, 3% in the parliament, as well in, in municipalities, uh, they're excluded from the economy. So 24% of women contribution to the economy. So they're excluded at, at all levels. Uh, youth, same. So if we have 50% women and 50% youth, so like this is a, a big, a, a big um, a proportion of the society that feels excluded. Urban exclusion, so if you look at Beirut, so if you look at downtown now, how, how it is, and how it's, it, it excludes people coming from, uh, from other areas in Lebanon and in the suburbs, so we're urbanly excluded. And there is exclusion as when now within communities, uh, you, uh, you, uh, if, you, if, you want, if you're a Shia or a Sunni and you want to rent in a Christian community, you, can, you have tough times having someone's going to accept to do this. If you want to open a bar in a Shia community, you have a problem doing this. So to say that uh, you, there is, there is a, a systematic exclusion of any diversity of any form. Uh, if we look at, I, I had another one, uh, if you look at economically, so there is the 10% that controls 70% of the wealth. So the, the, 90, the, the rest, the 90% remaining feels excluded from the economy because they control 70%. So this system that allows some form of religious expression is fake in terms of accepting or tolerating or, or including any other form of diversity, including Palestinian refugees and Syrian refugees. So yes, it's cool for the West to say, yes, Lebanon is a good message for the world of coexistence between Muslims and Christians. It's a cool Western concept, effectively on the ground. Everyone is, is no, not everyone, most people are excluded. This system serves the few that Khalid is talking about and not the many who are suffering, who we are all suffering socially, culturally, economically, politically, and security as well. So. To go back so to this uh, fake uh, pluralism, so we talked about f uh, formal v versus informal. And one interesting thing that Khalil said as well, so this and the I study about electricity, internet, and jobs, they asked them about like confessionalism. Confessionalism came 2% of the population who were interested in this issue versus, so people, uh, so the pri part of people's priorities wasn't the issue if their confession is protected or not. They were focusing more on socioeconomic issues. And I hope during these elections, we'll shift the conversation. And the conversation, though, the last two days, look how this pluralistic system is so uh, fragile. It took an insult from, from a minister to the Speaker of, uh, of the House to transform the city into a war zone. Are all the Shias mobilized? No. Like, in, in my office, in my campaign, in my circles, no, there are a couple hundred Okay, now we're, we're on tape, so a couple, couple thousand, uh, 20,000, still Shia are 30% of the population, weren't mobilized. And the other side, people who are mobilized and having guns. So the, this elite, and even during the civil war, the, the few who are mobilized because of clientelism, paying them, arming them. And I loved how, how um, he, uh, Khalil, put the two pillars of competition within community and regional interference. Yes, the, and so they have a good backup from regional sponsors, and this is why they can allow themselves. And I can tell you, if the regional sponsors wanted us to go into a civil war yesterday, would have gone. It's not because Shia and Christians wanted to kill each other yesterday. It could have transformed by default of someone's going to sponsor you. Someone's going to send you arms, or going to send you uh, money, or going to allow you, give you some international coverage to do this. I think it should have been after the elections, this panel, not before. <laughs> no, it what's interesting now is that yeah. now they're trying because they have different difficult sell. They cannot sell consociationalism because people are tamed by the same fear, fear game. Because this is my third argument why it's fake. So the third argument why it's fake because it's it's based on fear and not not based on possibility. Yes, that's the reality. Then you keep on supplying fear. They supplied fear for the last 30 years. They cannot supply it this time. So now they need to escalate the tools for the fear factor. So this is why yesterday was a good opportunity to try to escalate. 
Yes, it might work because identities changes. When Hassan Nasrallah and, and Michel Aoun, with all uh, respect, with the Mahafz al Alqab, uh, made a deal, then the Shia and the Christians, we started having a reportage on TVs how people are getting married, how Shia and, and Christians are getting married. And, how, and like a week before, so we used to have Shia Christian uh, s small violence between young people. Every other day, and the army used to go, it took literally one deal, and then since then, we never heard. Now we talk about like mixed marriages, doing small shops together, and doing businesses, to say that identities, and it's interesting that, as if we want to keep on anchoring that our identities that exist are, are definitive, and they, they will say being played on by fear, and Lebanese are sectarian by nature, and they will ever continue, yes. There are sectarian confessional identities. It, it does not mean that it can go as intensely to, to become violent like black and white in the US and Latinos. And I'm sure that the, the sense of identity to race and ethnicity in the US is way stronger than the sense of identity that, that I have towards my, my confession. So, it's, so another reason is it's based on fear and not on hope. So it's imposed, it's not voluntary. So we do not, sh we, so, so it's the, uh, this uh, consociational system that plays continuously on the fear factor is imposed on me. I didn't choose it, my constitution didn't choose it. My, par my, my uh, electoral law, I, I couldn't contribute to it. And Khalil knows how, how, because we know that electoral systems influence voters' behavior and their relation with their MPs. Our electoral laws have been designed systematically to enshrine keeping, keeping it small districts, making sure that it's, it's a sectarian seat, making sure that you can control how constituencies voting, um, uh, and all what comes with it in terms of uh, finances and media, uh, the use of media and finance, has been systematically designed to make sure that we're going to stay aligned within uh, uh, our sectarian uh, lines. We didn't try any. It's the first time we might have a window, and they might be in trouble, we'll see. So I'm running for that purpose. Uh, so, so pluralism for us has been the antidote of the modernity. Well, I'm, I'm done. The antidote of modernity and the antidote of development, and the antidote of ensuring any basic right for any citizen except the few. Because now, so if we look at poverty rates, unemployment, so it's just the few. So uh, this is why I think the discourse, making it a reality and maintaining it a, a reality, is a necessity for the actual elite to keep control of resources and power. And, and I think there is an approach to change it. And to close, what could be done? I think first is implementing our constitution. It's there. It's a nice constitution that has a transitional process. And you know, uh, whatever is the constitution, it's, it's the rule of law. So I don't think there should be an option not to, unless you change it from within. So th this is the first one. So Article, Article 9, Article 22, Article 24, and Article 95. The second thing is uh, probably uh, shifting politics through issue-based uh, political parties. And you know, let's have these conversations. Unfortunately, they only happen in these small rooms because media as well, in many cases, is controlled by the same elite. So probably using this opportunity during the next elections to engage maximum citizens on these conversations and, and shifting. And you know, during my experience with Beirut Medina last year, it was very interesting. In spite of all the, the sectarian discourse that was played when people were invited on issues, and then suddenly the last week, they copy-pasted exactly the same messages. It was very interesting. And we have the videos like literally comparing it, where part is the part of, they literally, literally said exactly the same sentences, which were very interesting when they first started working on identities and sectarian and the Sunnis and the Sunni fear. So, and my third one is probably do some cultural ce celebrations. I think we should celebrate the minorities in this country. Everyone is a minority. We should have a day for the Maronites and a day for the Druze. These minorities, in terms of cultural heritage, might disappear in 100 years. So the Baha'is, the Alawis, the Syriacs, like these are beautiful co human cultural heritage. But it does, and I think we should literally have <laughs> cultural celebrations, but it should not interfere in the citizen-state relation. This uh, individual citizen-state relation should be limited to this. 
Want to say something? Ah, sorry. That's it. So these are my three recommendations. Thank you. Before we go to our last, uh, but not this speaker, Joseph uh, Bahout, uh, Gilbert reminded me of the late Prime Minister Saib Salam. Uh, and he once said, if Lebanese are allowed, they will kill each other from hugging. Al-Khinaq min kisra al-Ainaq. Al-Khinaq min kisra al-Ainaq. So, uh, Joseph uh, Bahout is a seasoned uh, commentator on, on Lebanon and the Middle East, but I know Joseph is, is senior than a bit all of us because we were active in LADI in, in the 90s, and Joseph was one of the leaders of LADI in the mid-90s when, when there was a lot of optimism uh, in the country around change and the role of the non-sectarian or civil groups in, in change. So Joseph is a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Middle East program in the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. His research focuses on political developments in Lebanon and Syria and the regional spillover from the Syrian crisis and identity politics across the region. He's also currently an associate fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy and member of the scientific board on the French Institute for the Middle East. And he's author of many books on Syria, on Lebanon, and political reconstruction in Lebanon. And he's been a frequent commentator on European and Arab media on Lebanon and Syria and the Middle East. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in fact, this, this panel is, um, is quite plethoric in number, and it's, it's not at all a criticism. Uh, on the contrary, it's in fact a, a chance for me to be first brief because I won't bore you with uh, repeating what, uh, what others have said, but also it gives me the, the chance to pick up uh, points from here and there and agree with some and, and disagree with some. Uh, second, I'm happy to be at, the, at the, last, the last speaker at that panel because it will allow me maybe to round up a little bit and put again some uh, theoretical slash comparative dimension and maybe echo and prolong what Tamiras has said in the beginning by uh, also uh, picking up some samples in, in the empirical uh, statements uh, that have been made by people who are much more practitioners than me uh, on the Lebanese issue. Um, third remark, I thank you for having uh, warned me about my age first. <laughs> and, uh, and no, because, no, no, yeah, yeah, okay. But this is also to say that um, it, it will maybe explain part of my, let's say, uh, pessimism or gloominess in, in reading this issue of sectarianism, inclusion, and democratization in Lebanon. But having said that, when I came here this morning and when I prepared these few notes or these few remarks, I was afraid of being much more uh, reactionary or conservative that, that I will sound. I, I, was, I was saying to myself, I mean, I will appear as the defender of this bloody <laughs> cursed system and etc. And I'm happy that some people have uh, probably put some caveats on that. And, and I will say why, not only because the Lebanese system is maybe to be compared with what's happening in the region uh, since the Arab revolutions, the unraveling of the state system, but also before that within the context of, uh, of a region that is in fact hadn't hadn't known anything else than authoritarian systems or system, or uh, uh, to paraphrase Nadim Shahadeh, who is here, successful failed states like uh, Lebanon. I think Nadim has, <laughs> Na Nadim has a very nice uh, sentence to say Lebanon is the most successful of failed states uh, <laughs> on, on the planet. So uh, first of all, very quickly, because I think we are all tired. It's, it's after lunch. It's, we have heard a lot of very interesting things. I will, I will shed some bullet point light. On, on, on a few things. First of all, to remember that, and this is very important in terms of political sociology, political systems have, have a life. They are like human beings. They have a DNA, they have a life, they have an evolution, and they have an origin. They are not created out of nothing, uh, despite all the, uh, the genius of political scientists, be them Leipzig or others, uh, political systems have a political culture and a political history. 
So this is to remember that the Lebanese political sectarian system is, is not a new invention. It's a very old invention, not to say that it has to be fixated, not at all. But we have to remember that it was the product of historical event, of social formations, and of choices also by people. We like it or not. You can call them the elite or etc. But this was, these were choices at the moment where this is how politics uh, was done. I mean, this is the way it was done in the 1860, after the civil war, the mutasarifia, the règlement organique. Then uh, it's an uh, inheritance of the millet system of the Ottoman Empire that was at that time very inventive in accommodating uh, pluralism and, and, uh, and the question of heterogeneity, I mean, compared to other systems at that time. Uh, the Lebanese picked it up in 1920 with the French mandate, and then they renewed it in 1943, giving it a kind of, and we have, I think, to give it some credit, even if it foiled and, and, and failed with the war, giving it a kind of uh, message of political culture. You can call it a mythology of Christian Muslim coexistence and etc. But it was interesting. I mean, I don't think we can throw very quickly uh, under the bus uh, uh, the founding fathers' writings, be them Michel Shiha or later on Samir Franji and etc., by saying all this was fake and etc., etc., we have to keep this uh, in mind. Uh, corollary to that, and this is maybe the limit of the Lebanese political sectarian system today, uh, it was created or invented or crafted to accommodate uh, a Muslim Christian coexistence problem. Once again, fake or not, this is another discussion, but the, the Let's say the matière première, the, 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 the root, uh, the material with which we were working at that time was Christians and Muslims. Of course, beneath that, you had the subdivisions of Christians and Muslims. The problem is that the Taif agreement tried to repatch up the Christian Muslim thing, the parity, Munasafa. It's a Christian Muslim issue, whereby, in fact, the implicit or the underlying at that time uh, which was not visible at that time, tension and conflict that became very apparent a few years after the Taif Agreement was a Sunni Shia problem in the region and then in Lebanon. Uh, I think it's a very nice coincidence, at least for me personally, that Lakhdar Brahimi is here. He's the, I mean, he's the, we all know that he's the crafter of, of this thing. I don't think that the Shia Sunni uh, issue was present when you summed up the, the deputies in, in Ta'if. However, you knew that this was something that was going to probably grow up. You probably never foresaw that uh, the U.S. would invade Iraq in 2003, that the fall of Iraq would uh, probably unleash this problem, that the assassination of Rafiq Hariri in 2005 would open this uh, door on, on its uh, complete, I mean, wide open, and that the Christian Muslim problem in Lebanon would transform into a, a, a Sunni uh, Shia problem, of course, with other shades. That is, in fact, probably one of the limits of today's Taif agreement, and I will come to that in my conclusion. The last point, which is very interesting also, is that contrary to all other systems in the region that has shades or had shades of consociationalism, even the Syrian system or the Iraqi system, the Basi, very Jacobine centralized system, has provisions for personal status and etc. I mean, so there is these there are shades of consociationalism here and there. The, the, the issue or the particularity of Lebanon, you can call it the problem of Lebanon, is that this thing was legalized, was formalized, constitutionalized, and institutionalized. The interesting question is: it was institutionalized in 43, the National Park. It led to a mini civil war in 58. It led to a huge civil war in 75, or a war, if you don't want to call it civil war. The question is, and here again I turn, I turn to, to see Lakhdar, uh, why is the system that was in fact very strongly contested, and I would like to, I mean, advise my younger friends, sorry to remember my age again, that in fact in the 70s, in 71, 72, 69, etc., the elders here know that in this campus and elsewhere, the consociational system was much more contested than it is today. It led to a war. Not this led to a war. We had a war after that. Someone mentioned the document constitutionnel of 76, Leyman Frangi. If you read it, the main issue about 
the document constitutional and all the power, the, the conflict resolution devices that were on the table until Ta'if talked about the abolition of sectarianism in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. It was the program of the national movement, it was the program of the left, it was the program of some parties within the Christian milieu. But the question is, why was the system so resilient? So that, in fact, 15 years of war haven't almost changed anything in the sectarian system. If you look, it changed a proportion. Five to six became six to six only. This is the only thing that changed. All the other parts of the Taif agreement, and tell me if I'm wrong, have to do with privileged relations with Syria, have to do with other issues that were not at the core of the causes that led to the war. That this is an also historically an interesting question to be raised by uh, the civil forces today that are doing, in fact, kind of a remake of what has been done in the 70s and ask themselves why it didn't work and how it could work uh, this time. The second point, so this is the historical, let's say, uh, um, I mean, the, the historical point that I wanted to make. The second one is more a conceptual and theoretical one. I'm very happy that you did the, the homework in the beginning because it will allow me to go uh, much faster. And to add to what you say, you, what you said, uh, Three very important things. If you read the literature about the consociational systems, uh, there are three sine qua non conditions for these systems to function. And Lippert told, I mean, wrote about them and others also. And the three of them proved very quickly since the inception of the system in Lebanon to dysfunction and not to function. The first one had to do with the issue of the elites, elite recruitments which is a sociological thing. You, you, you don't create an elite. This is an illusion. You, you inherit, I mean, elites are produced by a sociological process. But elite picking, which is election laws, which is who do we choose to represent us, and etc. elite circulation, and also, and here I'm, I very much agree with, with Khalil, without going to the extreme of adopting everything you said, but I think that the issue of intrasectarian democracy is essential to the functioning of a sectarian system, which is kind of an oxymoron, but this is true. I think Ahmad Baidun has, a, has, has, has long uh, literature and long pieces on that, and I, I, I really advise you or encourage you to read them again. Uh, 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 there is something within the communities that, as, that is as important as what is happening between the communities in order for, for a consociational democracy to work, or at least for it to become democratic and not only illiberally uh, uh, representative, which is also a case of, of consociational democracy. So elite first. The second one, which is, I think, the, the job probably of what you are trying to do today, is the economic factor. All the consociational um, theorists point out and insist that without and in absence of a fair economic, first of all, rate of growth, distribution not only between uh, uh, classes and sex, but also between regions, a consociational uh, system will collapse, ultimately. And this is probably where, uh, without being, I mean, having a Marxian uh, reading, this is where the Lebanese system, I think, completely uh, failed. And it was not doomed to fail. I mean, the fact of having this hypertrophy of Beirut and etc., all the things that we know, was not something that was doomed. It is a political economy choice. And I'm not sure that this political economy choice was a kind of deterministic consequence of the consociational or the sectarian system. It has to be proven. And maybe, Sami, this is your next uh, research at LCPS. So this is very important, which leads me to say that maybe somewhere in the future, if you want to stick to the system that is governing us, we will have to look more closely, uh, not only on the economic, I mean, to the, towards the economic issue, but also the territorial issue, the territorial, uh, l'aménagement territorial, I mean, the territorial uh, uh, reshuffling or redistribution of, of uh, decentralization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The third one, which is obvious, and this is why I will be very fast, uh, the third sine qua non condition that consociationalists put as a, as a condition for the system to function is a stable and peaceful regional environment. 
I mean, this is Belgium, Switzerland, etc. This, this is where the consociational literature emerged, in fact. It emerged in, in these European countries. Lebanon, of course, 43, 48, you have the Israel and the Palestinian problem. And then, okay, let's not go into the history. You know it all. But this is where also things unraveled. And we have to think again also today in an environment that is probably going to be unstable for more than two or three decades, I'm sorry to be pessimistic, we have to take this uh, uh, factor into account in order to think about how to patch, or patch up again or unpack completely the consociational, uh, the consociational system. Now, the last point I wanted to make, and this was exactly what I proposed to the organizers of that conference, because when they invited me, I looked at the program and I said, okay, uh, what will I say differently from Tamiras or Gilbert or Khalil or Sami or etc. Because we all know this system and we spent uh, many years studying it, which could explain probably our depressive tendency. But uh, <laughs> I said, okay, maybe I will try to uh, draw some lessons from that and read the region of today. And this is exactly what you said in the beginning, or some of you. Uh, to say, okay, if Lebanon has something negative or positive to say to the region today, which is in fact a region in flux where you have systems that used to snub Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, etc., by saying you're a fake country, we are a true state, strong state, etc. Frankly, today, I think that this has to be completely nuanced. I mean, I don't think you find today a Syrian that is really happy to mock the Lebanese system and tell you we succeeded. I mean, this is not a success. So having that in mind, what can we say for tomorrow about that? I think that the lessons to be drawn from the Lebanese system are, are manifold. The first one, which is obvious, is, and all of you have said it, but the challenge is to find the political engineering device to make it is to acknowledge at least theoretically, philosophically, discursively, to acknowledge uh, the sociological pluralism. Uh, to say that, and you said it eloquently, to say there are sects in Lebanon doesn't mean that there are only sects in Lebanon, and doesn't mean also that sects are the uh, homo politicus of the system. It's not the, un the only unit of the system. It can be a unit of the system. It can be not a unit, but it can definitely not be the unit of mm. the system. So this is, this is the challenge. Acknowledge political, uh, I mean, sociological, but it's, it's a given. It's mm. a given. Acknowledging it, having in mind that it's fluid, it's uh, sometimes also strategic, you choose to be something at one point and something else the day after because it serves your purpose, actors are strategic, okay? Well, this is the first point, and you have to find the proper political engineering, constitutional engineering, and I think political science today is, is enough rich to provide us with, with models for that. The, the second one, I, I said it already, but I stress it again, is the importance of uh, the elite recruitment and circulation. And this is the, the issue of the technicality of electoral laws, political parties, uh, education, political culture, and etc., which is also to be uh, read again and, and be put in, in a new perspective in, uh, in our, let's say, political uh, project. The other question, which is probably the most important, uh, and you said it, or I don't know who said it, but today, uh, and Silakhdar, uh, this should be probably a subject for eternal pride for you, people say, okay, why can't we devise an Iraqi, ta an Iraqi ta if you heard it when you were in Iraq, why can't we find a Syrian ta if I think that uh, your successor who is much less brilliant than you, I can say, Stefan de Mistura is trying to do today. I'm not really flattering you only, but uh, I believe it. Uh, so how could be, what could be these ta'ifs, uh, et cetera? I think that there are things that could be imitated or, or um, inspired by Lebanon, and there are things that can definitely not for, not only because they are bad in Lebanon, but because they don't have the sine qua non condition of viability in these countries. First of all, what I started with, the historicity. None of these countries where we would like to apply a kind of if a kind of power sharing agreement, have a history and a political culture of political, not only pluralism, but political accommodation of that sort. If you talk to any Syrian activist, 
uh, whenever you start talking about a power sharing agreement, he tells you we don't want to replicate Lebanon, this is not our history, we're a strong state. We're... I, as a French formed person, I would say this is probably the legacy of the French Jacobinism. I mean, this idea of centralization, of strong state, of melted identities within one identity. I mean, we forget that France, for example, became France because it forbade at school uh, the, the, the teaching of languages. I mean, it was a very Soviet system. Um, churches was, were burned in France. We, we often tend to forget that. So there is no history of, of this kind of thing. Second, with corollary to that, and this is where the mythology is important. The National Pact has part of it that was uh, mythological. I mean, the, 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 the trade, the, the, let's say, the trade off or the quid pro quo between Pshar al Khuri and Riyad Salah during that parliamentarian session, because in fact, there's nothing else called the National Pact. There's no book, there's no article, there's nothing. It's a five minute exchange, verbal exchange, in the parliament uh, in, in 1943 be between these two old men saying, okay, we'll do that, and etc. Riyad Salah gave it a philosophical exception, which is very interesting, by saying the pact will Arabize the Christians of Lebanon and will Lebanonize the Muslims of Lebanon. So this quid pro quo doesn't exist elsewhere. There's no history about that uh, to resonate and to create this kind. The second limit, I think that will prevent probably a Ta'if in Syria at least, maybe not in Iraq. And I'm not talking about Ta'if in the constitutional uh, di division of uh, Fi'al Ula and etc. No, I'm talking about the, the concept, about the model, is that the Lebanese consociational system was able to be repatched up all along the history since 1860, 1958, 1975, 90, and maybe today again, because the Lebanese political culture, you like it or not, but it produces this, this famous slogan, since you were quoting Sa'ib Salam, of la ghalib wa la maghlub, i.e. no vanquish. I mean, of course, I mean, for me as a political analyst, definitely the war of Lebanon ended up with a clear van I mean, uh, winner and a clear loser. This is obvious. However, the, the narrative of the Taif Agreement, uh, and it is in the preamble, is to say that we all won or we all lost, and Lebanon is a definitive country for all its son and etc. This kind of narrative, of course, has to do with culture, but it has to do with something very, different, uh, very important, which is demographics. You can't do that if in a country like Syria, for example, take it as you wish, but at least in the perception, uh, the dominant group that has extracted power, exerted violence and domination and etc. is a minoritarian group mm -hmm. and the group that perceives itself as being suppressed, suffering and etc. is a majoritarian group. You can't tell them you both won or you both, you, you both lost because there's a clear winner and a, 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 a clear loser in that sense. The last one which is, is I think also something that you all said negatively but I would take it Positively, unfortunately, the Lebanese uh, consociational system could be repatched up at every uh, juncture, uh, here again, 1860, etc., and then uh, 1990, because there was an external guarantor. The external guarantor was either a tutelage power, Syria and Lebanon, but not only, it was a system. It was a Saudi, Syrian, American, European entente that was embodied by the political elite, by maybe Rafiq Hariri himself or etc. In, in 1860, it was a clear uh, document, I mean, the Reglement Organique, that was a Metternichian construction that Kissinger used in his PhD dissertation. I mean, this agreement between the Ottoman Empire and the Western powers, having a mutasarif that is always a Christian but non-Arab and etc. turned out to be an, Ar an Armenian, so. So, uh, so, so that's it. So there is a guarantor. Today the question is, when you see that the Arab order is in shambles and that the big Arab powers of yesterday that were the natural guarantors of a peace uh, order in the Middle East, i.e. Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Saudi, are themselves in crisis, you can ask the question, for example, who will, which country will be the Syria of Syria? If there's a Syrian Ta'if, which country will play in Syria the role that Syria played in Lebanon? Will it be Turkey? No. Will it be Iran? Turkey won't accept it. Will it be Russia? 
others, I mean, so this is also the other problem that prevent the Taif uh, model to be replicated elsewhere. This is what I wanted to say, but during the talks, I said, okay, maybe I should come back and land back to Lebanon to conclude. I would say, and this is why I'm pessimistic, that today, if you listen to all of us, uh, you say, okay, Lebanon is now at a very, very, very difficult crossroad, because in fact, it, it is facing three roads, three choices, and the three of them are almost impossible. The first one is to say with a lot of easiness, and uh, you allow me, with a lot of naive, naivete, okay, let's forget about all that and become normal, as if there is something normal in politics, and become a kind of Jacobin, unified state without any recognition of uh, etc. Fine, and I mean, Today, you look at the environment and you say, okay, we do that, I mean, with Egypt, with uh, Salafi movements, with Syria, with the fear factor, it's impossible. It's a project of new civil war. You say, okay, let's stay as we are. And we call uh, Lakhdar Brahimi or his uh, son, uh, his, his intellectual son today, and say, let's do a Taif again. Let's repatch the system. The system was 50-50, let's do it one third, one third, one third. Okay. We'll buy time, we'll buy 10 years, we'll buy 15 years, and then we'll do it again. And usually the Lebanese system evolves through crises, and these crises are usually violent. So we are buying in into a new civil war. This is the second gloomy road. And the third road is to say, and this is the temptation, let's be frank, in Lebanon, with many political forces, without naming names, to say, look, let's face it. I mean, we are heterogeneous. Territorially, we are almost divided and, and etc. We can't go and apply the law here and there and there. Some people want to keep weapons, some don't. Some people want to consider that they are at war with their environment. Some people want to live at peace with it. Let's go to the extreme of that and let's federalize slash confederalize etc. the system. This is also a project of a new war and new conflicts because there's no partition, there's no divorce except Czechoslovakia that happened in history without uh, uh, huge conflicts and etc. So today as a Lebanese I'm faced with, three, with these three, uh, let's say, choices and frankly I don't know what to do and what to say and this is why uh, very often when I'm invited to things like that which I'm very happy to be in, uh, I'm both afraid and, and mainly because I think we don't, we have not to be tempted by definitive uh, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, that was um, fantastic, uh, Joseph um, and everyone. Uh, we a bit over time, but we will definitely take uh, several rounds of questions. But first, I want to see if Mr. Ibrahimi would like to present. Uh, you were referred several times by most of the panelists. Uh, would you like to, in a couple of minutes, say something about the Taif, the... Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. I'll tell you a story. I'm not going to. You know, the late uh, Mahmoud Darwish, after the invasion and the Palestinians were thrown out of Lebanon, went to Tunisia. And he was in Tunisia. This, this is, this is, this is uh, history. This is fact. He was in Tunisia, and after several months, he was. Uh, one day, literally, you know, nobody saw him went to, to his house, he was not there, he disappeared. He just left Tunisia. Now the, the anecdote. The anecdote puts the war after Tunisia. So after Tunisia, when, when, when the story is that when uh, he left Tunis, he came to Beirut. Then came to the invasion. And he was in, uh, in hiding somewhere and smoking and saying, Bardo Ahsan Tunes. So this is, this is Lebanon. <laughs> okay. We'll take uh, three questions at a time. We have Muna, and then we have our colleague upstairs and other colleagues. So yes, we have three. Okay, so we'll start with Muna, and then we take the, our friends. Hello, uh, Muna Khneser from Isam Ferris Institute. So my question is addressed to Dr. Fakhouri. In discussing the consociational power sharing formula I realized that the analysis was missing a bit uh, a take on the political economy, on the socioeconomic dimension. Now, uh, given that the primary 
cause for the civil war in Lebanon were socioeconomic that later degenerated into identitarian and sectarian conflict. And given that the initial spark of the Arab uprisings were socioeconomic demands, and given that this model is being advanced as a solution for post-conflict countries, how much, does this mod how much is this model capable of addressing uh, the, the primary causes of conflicts or uprisings in our region, in Lebanon, in the civil war, and in the Arab uprising context? Thank you. Okay, we'll take two questions. Ahmed, please. Professor Asimani, ULCU. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the five lecturers. Uh, I have uh, a question for Mr. Gilbert Dumit and Mr. Joseph Bahout. Uh, concerning uh, what uh, you are recognizing, concerning the implementation of our constitution, uh, the political parties, founding new political parties, concerning also the territorial organization by Mr. Bahout. I think there are very important steps, but I think the first much important step is to collect all these political class and uh, make them choose between staying in Lebanon in jail or outside Lebanon on a boat. This is the first step to take. Second, to Mr. Joseph Bahout, I think the problem of our National Pact of 1943, uh, we cannot amend it. You know, because the regional conjuncture of uh, 43 is uh, different of the one we are uh, living in, in now, or 75, for example. I think the major problem in Lebanon is that we don't like to update our agreement or our pacts. The most important thing is every 10, 15, or 20 years is to accept between us to amend and to change and to make updates our constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you. And one more question, and then we will. Mohammed, four minutes. Hi. My name is Antonio Martin Borras Gomez. I'm an assistant professor here in AUB. Uh, well, first, thank you very much. It's been a, a great talk um, to you all. Um, but I am surprised of one thing, and it's that uh, after five interventions, um, there's been almost none and interventions that regard building pluralistic and inclusive states, there's been almost none a reference to decentralization. And the only reference has been made by uh, Joseph Bahut, who uh, actually was uh, somehow uh, regarding negatively decentralization by making a strange connection between federalization slash confederalization as is, as is as if it was the same, or if federalization has definitely led to confederation. Um, I think that um, there's room for uh, improvement, and there's room for or decentralization, political decentralization and autonomy offers way of uh, breaking uh, political deadlocks and allowing a consociational system to function. I will just give the example of Belgium. Belgium has been without a, a prime minister for uh, during uh, more than one year. Um, however, things were functioning. Spain also has been lacking a prime minister during some time recently, but institutions were functioning and there were public policies. And if there was any challenge in a territory, that challenge was faced. And the problem was were solved. Institutions were working, even without a prime minister. In, in Lebanon, we have this uh, provision in the Constitution for a Senate. I think that that also opens a way for uh, thinking about, about the Senate as a second chamber of territorial representation in case that there is a possible uh, uh, political decentralization. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. We'll uh, answer those uh, three questions. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Joseph. I, I, I don't really have an answer because I, I completely got what you said, but I don't think I said that. I don't think that I, first of all, I very clearly said that decentralization 
on a territorial base was something that has to be looked upon as a, as a, as a better solution for anything, for any political system that could be cho chosen. Uh, but then at the end I was very quick because I had to conclude and we're not in a seminar on feder I mean, federalization, confederalization, etc. But also I, I tend to agree with you that this could be inventively interesting. What I wanted to say, what I was saying in fact, is that due to the context around us, okay, the Kurdish question, uh, other questions in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere, uh, this is a door that, if you want to be pragmatic, will be a door of potential conflict <coughs> between uh, the components in Lebanon. Of course, on paper, federalization maybe could be a solution for many countries, but within the context that we are living today in the Middle East, this is the, this is the case. This is only what I said, and I really don't want, because we don't have time, and this is not the issue, to enter in the technicalities of what could federalism be in Lebanon or elsewhere, or confederation and the difference between and etc. Okay. Uh, thank you for a great question on the theory of consociationalism. Well, I didn't have time to delve into the socioeconomic issues, but I can tell you what Leipart says about uh, sectarianism and socioeconomic issues that, uh, you know, the question is raised whether sectarian cleavages um, are uh, cross-cut or, or, or reinforce socioeconomic cleavages. So let's say if I find that Christians are all r much richer than the Muslims and the Muslims are the poorer, then yes, it would be, for example, a great cause like for uh, uh, finding an incidence between sectarianism and socioeconomic issues. Before the war, many sociologists in Lebanon did a study and found out that this was not the case, that there was a nuanced, uh, you know, socioeconomic uh, status when it comes to the Christian and Muslim communities. And although, of course, socioeconomic issues played a role, but, you know, there, there wasn't a direct clash in how sectarian and socioeconomic cleavages intersected. Um, at least uh, according to the eminent sociological studies that were done back then. But having said this, of course, I agree with you that any consociational or power sharing model that cannot accommodate identities and socioeconomic issues is a failure, a total failure, because uh, this is one of the most prominent and overriding issues in the wake of the Arab uh, uprising transformations. And also one thing, if you're interested in reading about this, you can read maybe Caroline Hartzell's work on economic power sharing, whereby she attracts our attention that power sharing talks a lot about political, sectarian, racial, ethnic issues, but we have to delve a bit more into the econom economy of political power sharing. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. We'll go around the table. Do you have anything to add? Many. Yeah. <laughs> Briefly, now we're, we're out of time. Okay. Just, the, just to answer the question quickly, I, I think um, maybe because I'm in a campaigning mode, so my, my attention is high and ha had an overnight yesterday. So first, uh, let's recognize that, yes, this country is diverse in religious, uh, in religious identities, and that's beautiful to be celebrated. There is a political elite that is in power and has a lot of resources and capacity to negotiate, to leverage, and that should be recognized on the table. We're not going to send anyone out. I think the only difference is that now, and I want to build on what, what Joe said, is that this consociational model does not work unless the, the political economy and economic component is as well coping with it. So which surprises me a little bit in, in your three options. Um, so, so why there wasn't a fourth option, which is the in-between all those, means how can we recognize and uh, more, more than protect, celebrate the diversity of identities and protect and give a sense of protection for the different uh, confessions in the country, while at the same time allowing a, a mechanism, which is the parliament and other institutions, to provide ba basic public services and economic development that would balance this, which is our constitution. So it's neither going for mortality or going for like total secularism. So why not something in the middle that would allow us to survive, at least with the minimum, while celebrating, so which I want to call deep pluralism. A pluralism that is more sustainable, that recognizes, that is driven by rights, rather than driven by numbers. I think, and I'm going to conclude with this, I think the worst thing that the Christians in this country and other minorities can do is playing the game of numbers. Because eventually, 
this will need for another war, but instead leading the modernization of the state through the socioeconomic issues while protecting their identity within a vehicle, a system that allows them to live and express and celebrate their, their faith. So I think something in between would be good. Thanks, yeah, thanks. thanks Nasser. Uh, and I want to make very short three comments. First, I don't, this is not the venue to talk about, but this discussion about civil war and socioeconomic, again, is a little bit misleading. It's about grievance of sectarian identity of access to, to economic resources. So it's not really about socioeconomic evolution of Lebanese. So we have to be careful how we, we mention this, this issue. That's first. Second, uh, again, there is, have been in the past few years, uh, very good master thesis about Wasta in Lebanon, and or favoritism in the sense of it. So uh, one thing, we have to be very careful by using terms like exclusion and stuff like that, or trying because actually the Wasta system, which is part of the, of the backbone of the sectarian system, the Wasta system, actually makes the system a little bit uh, not inclusive. So we have to be careful about the usage of term. Let's agree that who, 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 whoever is excluded or doesn't want to be identified in part of the sectarian identity is excluded, yes. But usually the system manage, and we see this in appointments in terms of army and all other stuff. No, the system is inclusive in this kind of thing. And so neither the rural urban taxonomy nor the exclusion can needs to be chosen in the right term. The last point, this issue of decentralization in a sectarian or in, in a divided society, with all our respect to the Belgium and Switzerland model, uh, it, it is, it's, it, we should study much better the concept of decentralization in system like Lebanese, especially, uh, especially given the system of Lebanese where there is the other factor, I mean someone and the other. Uh, we already know today about a lot of areas in Lebanon where you cannot buy land or register or buy a house simply because of different of sectarian positions. And uh, so again, talking about decentralization, I mean, decentralization in its textbook definition sometimes need to be studied differently in terms of divided societies. And maybe Bosnia as a model is worth looking at it in this sense. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Sure. Uh, quickly, a um, couple of things. Um, just to pick up on, uh, okay, so, so just to also reflect on what um, Khalil said, uh, I think what we ought to try to do is show the absurdity of the political institutions mm -hmm. and exposing the elite rather than say what is and what should be. I mean, we know what you're, I completely agree with how decisions are made. We know from electoral law, eight years in parliament and it takes an evening of five people overnight to, to sign off on it, you know what I mean? Where even parliamentarians have never read it and totally right. And even when we looked at the like, oil and gas law, where when we were looking at the committee's deliberations, uh, they were saying one thing, and then Berri and Senora step out, and uh, the whole thing changes, right? You know what I mean? So, but the idea is to expose that and to remind ourselves that there will be no economic or socio-economic plan. And I should say that the system not only has failed, has no capacity to imagine any economic plan beyond infrastructure. And we're seeing it exactly today, replicated of the 1990s. And the infrastructure is very good. And this is what I'm also a bit surprised that we didn't get to talk a lot about, the political economy of the whole system, where economic rents are created to keep the system intact and fuels and gives oxygen to the system. So I think we're giving too much attention to the identity sort of angle to it. I think those guys are much more sort of business-like and much more adaptable to change. And I think the conflict in the last 10 years or 15 years uh, since Hadir's assassination is actually because the economic rent has shrunk. Hadir is lost to the uh, assassination, but his ability to come and provide beef the system with oxygen with, 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 with the economic rent that actually satisfied the many political elite, you know what I mean, was a major sort of catalyst for things moving in the 90s. When this started, when this was lost and the, the thing was shrinking, we saw many in, um, intra-elite fighting and we, we saw that, but yet maintained the overall, as I said, the stability factor or the security issue. So, so I think that's really important because I think once we look at that, we really understand better when it stops them. I think we're giving it too much as a sort of rigid identity sort of focus. And on decentralization, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think this is, you know, one 
it doesn't have to be this or that. I think it's much more nuanced. I mean, I've been involved in these debates in Parliament and in drafting the law. Uh, we can have a session on that, I think, just to sort of discuss it. And I think the WASTA issue and the exclusion, also what Khalil said, I think is very important because it sheds light on the fact that some people are actually not because they are Christian or Marinette or Shia. It's just because who has the political network and he is he or she is electorally useful, can get access to services, you know, rather than the, so, so hence when you see that way sectarianism and identity is just a veil, it's useful, it's instru instrumentalized, and I think True. it's actually uh, rather than being sort of hardcore, rigid identity sort of thing. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Sammy. Thanks everyone for this great panel. <laughs> we'll break. We'll break.